Well, welcome everybody. What a beautiful sight this is to see so many great looking faces. I hope you're all doing well and you're staying safe. This is a great evening that we're gonna have together. I'm Lee Pollock, for those of you who don't know me, and this is our opportunity to spend some time with a good friend and a mensch and a community leader and an extraordinary entrepreneur, our friend, Alan Lazowski. This is the part two of our business and innovation series, the third community-wide men's engagement event we've held since the beginning of the summer. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you're rejoining, welcome back. Jay Gershman will tell you more about the Federation Men's Engagement in a minute, but first, a couple of housekeeping items. Most of you have had Zoom before, but let's go over a few things. You can change the screen view by clicking in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. There's a speaker view that shows the person who's speaking, and the gallery view lets you scroll through everyone who's on this call. Just rem remember, we can see you. So be careful, we've heard, everybody's had horror stories about people doing weird things on their screen. We can all see you. Some of you may be heading to the virtual NCCJ Awards later tonight. Cocktails for NCCJ start at six and the program begins at 6.30. So our program will, will end around 6.30, but feel free to drop off a few minutes early if you need to. Last but not least, Programs like this would not happen without the support of our business partners. They offset the costs of the programs like this one so that more of your annual campaign contributions can go back into the community. Please join in me and thank, give a, a round of applause to our business partners. Thank you all. Now, Jay, take it away. All right, well, I've been asked to uh, speak about why men's engagement uh, they've given me three minutes, and if anybody knows me, you know that I'm only warming up in three minutes, but I'll do the best I can. I'm Jay Gershman, co-chair of Men's Engagement, along with Eric Zacks, and on behalf of our great team, that includes Coleman Levy, Ron Cipriano, Simi Benita, and the technology and marketing people that make these events so great, Susanna, Sam, and Bill, I want to thank everyone for joining tonight's program. I hope you had a chance to watch my video message that was included in the invite. So I'm gonna say a few words tonight and I hope I won't be redundant. I find putting my love for Judaism and being Jewish into words difficult. I ask myself, why is being Jewish so important to me? It can't just be the religion itself since I'm not religious. I ask myself, why is it that one of the most important things to me was something I didn't even work for, but was a gift given to me by my parents and grandparents at birth? I don't have the answers. I just know that I can go anywhere in the world, meet a Jewish person, and within a few minutes feel like I'm talking to an old friend. Give me five more minutes and we know the same people, and five more minutes we're related. All of my best childhood memories involve brisket and chicken soup at Bubby's or delivering furniture with my Zadie. Holidays were large and loud and a lot of laughing, and I could understand what they were saying even in Yiddish. Being Jewish was an indescribable sense of being part of history and something to be proud of. As I've gotten older, my Jewish family roots have passed away, leaving me to carry on the love of Judaism to my children and set an example for them to follow by showing them my commitment to causes that help my people. I feel a sense of responsibility that when my community needs help financially, I say, Hineni, here I am. Whether there's a call today for emergency support due to the pandemic or a plan to raise funds to support the needs of this community long after I'm gone, shouldn't I help those ways? Yes. I've heard my friends say Federation always has their hands out. No, I say Federation always puts their hand out to support causes most dear to us, like Jewish Family Services and Terrace Closet, the amazing work of Voices of Hope, the day schools, JT Connect and Hillel, who produce our Jewish leaders of the future. And let's not forget the JCC, a place that's central to our community. So men's engagement, is our answer to helping men of this community get involved, learn, make friends, make new business connections, participate in team building, 
and fundraise and help with the great work this wonderful organization, the Federation of Greater Hartford does. So much of these goals that we have for men's engagement are on hold because of the pandemic. However, we are building a fan base. If you have participated in one of our programs these past months, I ask you to reach out to your children, your Jewish friends and colleagues, especially those under 50, and invite them to join us in future events we are planning. I consider myself just an ordinary Jewish guy from a middle-class family in Bloomfield. Regardless of who you are and what you have, you and I can do extraordinary things to make this community a better place and lead by example for our children. Now I'd like to talk about why tonight's interview with Alan Lazowski is extra special for me. As I said, you may not be aware, but I grew up in Bloomfield and graduated from Bloomfield High School with Alan and his first partner, Jeff Carp. I have to admit that when our 1978 yearbook came out, I was somewhat surprised that I was not selected most likely to succeed. Alan was. I thought after all, I was president of Future Business Leaders of America. How could I lose? Now, 42 years later, there is no doubt that my classmates saw something in Alan that all of us who have known him since have witnessed unparalleled success. As a business owner and entrepreneur myself, I have hired countless consultants and business coaches in order to be successful. I have learned what attributes successful business owners possess. I have met successful entrepreneurs who have a great idea. I have met some who are charismatic, some who are really smart and really intuitive some who are very likable, some who are great bosses and inspiring leaders, some who are extremely persuasive or never give up, those who innovate and those who motivate. You think about anyone you know who is a very successful business owner and ask yourself, how many of these qualities do they possess? If you're lucky, it's three or five. Take all of these attributes I've listed and wrap them in a package of values instilled by Rabbi and Ruth Lazowski, and you have Al Lazowski, an amazingly successful person who has not changed in the 50 years I've known him, except this year, because he doesn't give you the big bear hug when he sees you. I can't wait to hear from Al about his journey from valet parking to parking lots to real estate investor and now parking giant. Al, a lot of time has passed since I plowed snow for you at the Hilton Hotel downtown or built your East Hartford offices. I know everyone tonight will enjoy your lessons and insight. And now we have a quick video that will give you a sense of why I'm proud to be part of Federation. After the video, Federation President and CEO David Warren will introduce Alan. Jay, that was beautiful. And I want to pick up really where you left off. It was a great segue to my introduction of Alan. Um, any introduction of Alan has to start, Jay, as you mentioned, with values. 
At Federation, we launched a values initiative this past year, frankly, inspired in many ways by Last Parking and funded by Allen. Many of you in your own businesses have worked to define and publicize your guiding values. Values guide your priorities, the behaviors of your staff, and your branding. And branding, of course, is what people say about you or your company when you're not in the room. Alan's values and his ability to imbue those values in the behavior of his staff and in Laz Parking's brand have been critical to his success. Alan's values undoubtedly have been shaped, Alan, by your parents and by their experience, not only of survival in the Holocaust, but also of taking care of strangers, one Jew responsible for another. Alan, of course, and many of you have heard his parents' story, Alan is here today because a stranger risked her life to protect his father. And in turn, Alan's father risked his life to save others. Those are the lessons that Alan was raised with. Alan also lives by the ideal, grounded in Jewish values, that the only money one permanently earns is the money one gives away. Alan is one of the most generous people I know, both with his financial resources and his time, impacting, of course, literally hundreds of organizations every year. His leadership and philanthropy are a visible inspiration. What's not visible are the thousands of people Alan helps with little or no fanfare his meetings with prisoners, and creation of jobs for ex-felons. The way he has quietly helped so many of his employees over the years overcome personal crises. His successful lobbying to the highest levels of Congress for unemployment aid that has helped millions over these past months literally put food on the table and pay their rent. One brief story uh, and I hope I'm not giving away any secrets, Alan. Really, it's a brief story, it's a simple story, but, but for me it's indelible and I think it really exemplifies who you are and I know there are hundreds of stories. Alan and I were having dinner at a restaurant called La Brochette on Lexington about two years ago. It was a late dinner and we came out and a limo came. Uh, I think Jesse was in the car, Alan, and um, Alan's daughter. Uh, and the limo came, opened up, and Alan said, let me introduce you to my daughter and, and, and the driver. And we started talking, and the driver was unbelievably enthusiastic. And he said, look, I've got to tell you this story. He said, I've got to tell you how I met Alan. So Alan was a passenger I think, in, in his taxi, Alan, uh, in the back seat. Uh, and they started talking, and Alan asked him, what's your dream? What, what do you want to do with your life? And he said, my dream is to own, again, this was a total stranger. My dream is to own a limousine company. On the spot, Alan decided to finance this person's dream. And he created his own limousine company. Literally, he was a successful entrepreneur with a fleet of limousines because of a chance passenger that he picked up, Alan Lazowski. And that story, again, it's not in the news. It's not public. But there are, I know, Alan, there are hundreds of stories like that. And it so reflects your character. Alan, there's no better, better role model for me, no better exemplar of our Jewish values and the values that make this community so great than you. I'm proud to call you a friend and I'm deeply appreciative. I know how busy you are that you've agreed to join us tonight. Alan will be interviewed by, by Ben Zachs. Uh, ben is the COO of Fine Fettle Dispensary. Uh, and then after the interview led by Ben, we're gonna have time to open the floor for questions. So at this time, please welcome Alan and Ben. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Uh, as David mentioned, I'm Ben Zachs. Uh, I'm really excited tonight to interview and talk to really talk to Al, who has been a friend and a mentor for my entire life. And so this is pretty cool to see sort of the next generation of this being a part of it, as Alan brought up last night so when we were prepping for tonight, but um, I'm just going to do some housekeeping first. So another story from last night, Jay was messaging me and talking to me about how he needs to text me during the chat and whatever, so I can see what's going on. But 
this is my wheelhouse in the technology world. And so if you just go into the chat and put the questions directly into the chat to everyone, I will read them. I will do my best to interweave them in throughout uh, if there's something that's really pressing that you want to know. But just let it out there to the crowd. And then um, the last piece of housekeeping is just to let you know that actually in November, I am going to be the one interviewed, which is wild to me, but uh, about working in the legal marijuana industry, what that means in terms of medical marijuana, uh, adult use legalization in Connecticut in the country. And so as we continue that business innovation, but uh, I'll stop about us and, and really get started and just we'll get started, Alan. So a lot of people know this initial piece of the story of Laz Parking starts out of a dorm and valeting cars at UConn. And, but over the last 40 years, it has changed a lot. So if you could give us just the, the sort of synopsis of where you started and how you got to today to seeing parking, real estate, airport parking, limousine services, et cetera, and uh, talk us through this journey of, of your career. Thanks, Ben. First, I just want to start off, if you wouldn't mind, by uh, thanking David uh, for that beautiful introduction and uh, story. And David, I just want to tell you how so very lucky we are to have you in our community and at the helm of this amazing institution. And, um, and I want to also thank uh, Lee and Jay and Coleman uh, for recruiting me. And, um, you know, thank you all for your tremendous leadership. And Jay, uh, it's amazing that we've been friends uh, since 10 years old and uh, growing up together. And it's just an honor to see you such a great, uh, become such a great leader and part of the Jewish community and a great entrepreneur yourself. So thank you for that. I'll give you a kiss uh, from here. And it's really an honor for me to share some thoughts with everybody today. Um, I hope everyone's healthy and safe and I appreciate everyone tuning in. Ben, you know, I was so glad when I found out the other day that you were going to interview me because and you were recruited and you volunteered. And, um, you know, um, you know, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you and, and all your accomplishments. You know, I've known you uh, since you were born. And, um, and so I could talk with a, a bit of authority um, when I talk about the subject that you're truly representing what we call the door of a door, the transfer of goodness and kindness from generation to generation. There's no better example of a family in our community that is so committed uh, to making this world a better place uh, that cares such so deeply about our Jewish community and our greater community, um, from your amazing grandparents, Henry and Judy, to my loving friends, your parents, Jessica and Eric, and 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 now you and Paige and Louie and uh, baby Louie, and of course your amazing brother Jacob and your beautiful and brilliant sister Zoe. Uh, you know, thank you, Ben, for uh, inspiring us and being here and showing us what the next generation of leaders in our community can become. You're, you're, you're a real mensch, and, and I really appreciate it, and it's an honor. And, you know, speaking of Lador Vador, I just want to, I got to give a quick shout out to my dear friend Gail Temkin, who uh, I hope is on the call tonight, but I'm not sure if she is. Uh, she received the Voices of Hope uh, Lador Vador Award last night, and some of you might have tuned in. And Gail, uh, just on behalf of our entire community, uh, thank you for perpetuating the acts of goodness of kindness of your mother and father and instilling those acts with Steve to your past, passed down to Alyssa and Lily. Um, thank you for your courage and strength, Gail, for your beautiful heart that's filled with such goodness and kindness and inspiring us all to know that we must stand up and be counted and give back to our community and make this world a better place. We're, Gail, we're lucky to have you in our lives and we love you, congratulations. So getting to your question, Ben, um, can you repeat that? 
Yeah, just really, <laughs> can you give the background of the journey of, hey, we start in our dorm valeting cars and now you're doing parking, real estate, car services, you got the airport, you're all over the country. Talk about sort of the journey and the step on, on the business side. Well, first thing I'll just tell you, you never grow up thinking you're going to go into the parking business, especially becoming a valet parker. And for those of you who remember, um, Last Parking's first account in June of 1981 was Frank's Restaurant, uh, where uh, I was the first valet parker at Laz uh, at, at that location. And, and uh, I, I did work that location for... Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of years parking cars at night and selling deals during the day. And, um, you know, I was lucky that my grandfather uh, believed in me and lent me $3,000 to start my business. Uh, and I paid him back, um, you know, six weeks later. And I happened to tell my dad who, you know, was a rabbi, had a master's and a doctorate that I wasn't gonna finish my six courses left at UConn, I was gonna stay as a valet parker. So that's how it all started. Very nice. And so when you sort, as you sort of go from there and continue on, where were the points where you were like, this is the right time to pivot, or this is the right time to move into a new space or be aggressive? How do you sort of take a, take a step back and say, this is going well, but I need to move forward? Yeah, I, I believe you gotta be opportunistic uh, and, you know, you could write any business plan you want, but along the way, things happen in your lives, situations change, and you have to look at those opportunities and take advantage of it. For me, one of the pivotal, pivotal points was um, actually a story about uh, a mentor and a dear friend to our community, Mr. David Chase. And I had about six locations uh, in uh, 1982 and I happened to approach uh, uh, David, and he had, he, as many of you know, he was a Holocaust survivor and a friend of my dad's, and he uh, was a huge developer and a great entrepreneur, and he owned the Hilton Hotel in Hartford, and I approached him, and I said, you know, I really love to do the valet at your hotel. I was 22 years old, uh, and he looked at me, and he said, well, not only are you gonna do the valet, you're gonna run our entire commercial parking garage operation. And I never ran a commercial garage before in, our, in my life. And I said, sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, he believed in me more maybe than I believed in myself, but I took on that opportunity. And uh, in one year, we raised the net income of that facility by 50%. And all of a sudden, we were deemed experts by the Hilton Hotel Corporation that we knew what we were doing running parking. Uh, and uh, the truth is, we didn't do much. We were just honest and I was there 24 seven and you know, we got lucky and, uh, but it was a pivotal moment because you know, there was somebody that became a dear mentor and friend of mine that you know, gave us an opportunity and gave me an opportunity. But as I, go forward, we, we started um, buying real estate in the mid 80s in Hartford and, you know, going to banks and, and, you know, it was, we didn't have much of a balance sheet. So you had to find bankers that believed in you. And I was lucky enough to find some people that would give us loans and, and do that. Uh, and um, so we had some success in the mid 80s. And we also endured um, the crisis the real estate crisis in 89, 90, 91. So there was a lot of lessons learned along the way. Uh, and uh, from those lessons, you gain a lot of strengths. I'll fast forward to another big moment in our careers. In 2006, um, we decided that we would bid on the first public-private partnership in the United States which was the largest underground garage system in Chicago. And it was a bid um, as an international deal. Uh, and um, we decided to bring Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Group into the deal as a partner. 
and um, and we'd never been in Chicago before, and it was a $563 million transaction, and we won that deal, and it put us on the international map. And so, uh, you know, there are moments like that in business that, that change the trajectory, but you have to be willing to take those chances and go out there and believe in yourself and believe that you can do it. Yeah, I think a part of that is, is this idea of what is like, what does it mean to take on risk, right? And what does it mean to go for something that doesn't sort of look, look easy and simple? And so when, I, when you sort of pivoted from, not pivoted, but continued on to go from parking into real estate, was that sort of the first one of those, hey, we're going to change the business model and look at the risk? Or have there been other times before that where you were like, all right, I'm going to do something different versus my bread and butter, and we're going to try and learn as we do it? Yeah. Well, um, thank you for asking that. Parking, um, although it's an operating business, it, it is actually a real estate related business. So our whole career was really based on understanding income and expenses and projections and leases and, and numbers and buying parking garages that might be part of another development, uh, a larger development. So that was uh, somewhat of, of a natural pivot for us. Uh, but along the way, we've had to reinvent ourselves and look at different silos, different activities uh, like the shuttle business or the event business or, or other businesses that we go into uh, along the way. Was there, has the, was there a point or has there been the point yet where you took a step back and realized like, whoa, we, we've made it. We are like, this is the success that I wanted to have. Or do you think that's ever evolving and changing? Or, or can you remember that, that sort of moment where it was different? Yeah, you know, I think if your mindset is you have a lot more work to do uh, and uh, you never really have made it. You know, it's, um, you know, we're all about creating opportunities for our employees and value for our clients. And, you know, at LAS, we were lucky enough now to have, pre-COVID at least, we had 15,000 amazing people. Uh, unfortunately, we had to furlough a number of people, actually 8,000 people uh, that we had to furlough during this crisis. And uh, that pained us because in 40 years, we never furloughed one employee and we've already brought 2,500 of those employees back. So now we're motivated to do everything possible to bring everyone back as quickly as possible. So I think, you know, if you have a never ever give up attitude and you're always setting new goals and, and objectives, uh, you don't really rest on the, on the past, you look forward to the future. Obviously COVID is the, the moment right now, but you've already talked about the real estate crisis in 1989 and we had the recession in 2009. And in a certain way, while this is different, it is also another one of those, right? Because yeah. we continue to see problems. How do you think that previous economic world events have affected the way you're able to adapt today to see what's going on? Yeah. Well, the first thing that I have to say about crisis is I believe you need resiliency. You need to be optimistic. You need, you need a certain mindset. And I get that strength from my parents. Uh, and, you know, um, the fact that my mother and father were able to survive in the woods uh, in, in Poland uh, for two and a half years uh, without food or shelter, and th live through starvation and disease where 80% of the people that went into those woods did not survive. And my dad came out like a skeleton at 15 years old and you know, eventually made it to the United States and became the great spiritual leader that he is today. Uh, you realize as a survivor of, of a child of a survivors that you know, anything's possible in life and you never ever give up. And, and what we sometimes think in our mind are really big deals. When you hear stories like Faith and Destiny and my parents' story, you realize that 
you know, what I thought was a big deal, maybe it's not that big a deal and I can accomplish anything. So uh, that, that's sort of a, a psyche that I believe you have to have, but certainly you gain strength by going through adversity. And, you know, I, I, there's no question in my mind that Laz and my partners uh, are, are more prepared to go through the crisis we've gone through uh, recently because we've gone through other hard economic times. And I think a lot of people on this call would agree with that. Uh, you know, we all have ups and downs in life and business. And if you have a mindset of optimism, if you have a mindset of resiliency, uh, you have an attitude of never ever giving up, uh, you can accomplish anything. And I believe in that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're examples of that in some ways. Right, and I think, so Ron Schlossberg asked a question in, in here and he commented before the question saying that he thought of you as fearless. Right, and fearless in a sense also means that you're willing to take on risk. And it also means that you're willing to have optimism in, in areas of doubt. But in terms of a time where you were most worried, what is something that sort of rings a bell and brings back and says, is this right? Or you weren't sure about the decision you were making because there was an immense amount of risk involved or something that you didn't think you could handle? Yeah. Well, Ron Schlossberg is just a wonderful individual. And uh, I'll tell you a short story about Ron. He was a consultant of ours many years ago when we had a limousine company. And I had him uh, on a plane one day, I think we were going down to Virginia, Ron, and it was a small plane and it was really turbulent, if you remember. And, you know, I was with him and one of my partners, Mike Kuziak, and they were all gripping the, the chair and worried about what was going to happen. And they looked at me uh, eating peanuts and, and just sitting back. And they said, how could you be so calm in this situation? And I said to both of them, guys, it's not your time. We're going to be OK. And uh, so, uh, Ron, um, uh, thank you for your friendship all these years. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's all a mindset, and if you're if you if you believe in optimism, sure we all have tough times and worries, uh, but um, you know if you choose to be optimistic, you know your mind can bring you to different places. It still gets back to choosing to be optimistic because uh, the outcome is going to be the outcome. But if you're optimistic, you can will your way through, and I I, I firmly believe in that. Right. And as Holocaust survivors, as your parents, there's no better mentors on the planet to see and understand the idea of getting through, right? There's nothing else in, in the world, people who are alive now that can even close to compare to that. And so to think about it in context of what am I worried about versus what were they worried about, it creates a different sort of perspective around the idea of optimism and pushing through. And, and speaking of that, so your parents obviously create a, a certain level of mentorship, but, and you talked about David Chase before, but who else have been some of the other mentors, either in big or small ways that have uh, allowed and affected you to learn and grow and, and become the success and bring Laz to the, the scale that it's gotten to? You know, that I could go on and on and on about those stories. And a lot of the, the mentors that I would talk about are on this call right now. Uh, and uh, in so many ways, you know, everyone's story uh, is an inspiration. And, you know, when you sit and talk to people, and I, I believe that you got to talk to everyone. I believe in saying hello to everyone. I believe, as Jay mentioned, hugging everyone and, and getting to know as many people as I can. And I think when you hear people's stories, you know, there, there's a lot of gifts that you could create. And, um, you, know, um, you know, one of my mentors is, is uh, a dear friend of mine who uh, is, her name is Jan Janice Fleming. Unfortunately, she's an African-American woman who lost uh, her mother when she was 16. Uh, she lost her father to AIDS when she was 17 and her and her older sister 
brought up her four younger brothers and sisters. And she did, she lived in, in Hartford and, and grew up very poor, but brought up those kids. She put herself through Trinity College eventually. She, she started an amazing organization of Voices of Women of Color. And she's the, uh, the first female African-American lobbyist in the state of Connecticut. And she's a tremendous leader and a tremendous friend. And she has been recruited by APAC, okay? Uh, and, and this is an amazing story. She's been recruited by APAC and, and Jamie Silverstein, who's a great leader, um, recruited her and she's been to Washington lobbying for the Jewish community and lobbying uh, uh, for Israel. And, and um, when she was asked uh, by some of the people, what, you know, what brings her here? Uh, she says, you know, so many of my friends in the Jewish community in Hartford have done so many great things for my community that I felt and it was incumbent on me to learn about the Jewish community, to learn about Israel and to give back. And that's why I'm here. And that's the type of bridge building that David Warren does. That's the type of bridge building that the Jewish Federation does. And when we can help people in our community, in our greater community, uh, it's a gift. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, I come from a household that definitely thinks you, you have success to give back more. And you have clearly done that throughout your career. And that's in Hartford. And that is worldwide and spanning now across so many multitudes of philanthropy and tzedakah. What do you think that your Judaism is part of the reason for the philanthropic efforts that you've committed to? And how have you thought about the idea of spanning your philanthropy, not simply in Judaism, but across like our larger scope and our larger world? I mean, and I think that's incredibly apt looking at what we're seeing across healthcare, hunger, civil rights today, where, where you've been a part of all of those. Well, the first thing I, I have to say is that I think, you know, I've had the greatest example of, of giving back and giving charity from my mom and dad and growing up with it. So, you know, you know I think if you learn at an early age uh, what kind of gift it is to be able to give. Because uh, when, when you give, you receive a lot more in return. And when you give unconditionally, you get a lot more in return. And, you know, I was a student of that, you know, watching people come into our house 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, that, you know, were just needed help or needed a helping hand and watched my dad perform those mitzvahs. And uh, so that was a fine example of that. And, um, you know, I spend about a third of my time on philanthropy and charity, and I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. And that's one of the mo ma main motivating forces that I want, do, want to work so hard for is to be able to give back more. But, you know, that that's an example of, of great leaders in our community, great mentors uh, that are on this call and throughout our whole community. You know, think of a guy like Gene Rosenberg that, that's given so much to our community. Think of a, your grandfather, Henry Zacks. He lives for giving to our community. You know, so, you know, I could go on and on and on and on, and these are great mentors and examples. I'll, I'll never forget uh, the first gift I gave to the Federation. It was a huge gift for me. I was 23 years old. And that, that's, that's 37 years ago. And I got approached by a wonderful gentleman who was my in-laws, uh, one of my in-laws best friends, uh, Frank Stavis. Everyone here remember Frank um, an amazing, amazing Oliver Shulman, an amazing soul, an amazing individual. 
And Frank, um, in his beautiful, kind way, um, really encouraged me to give Sadaka, give charity to the Federation. And I gave an $1,800 check, I think I was 23 years old, and it was a lot of money. It was a big gift. And um, I, I'll tell you, I never regretted it. And I thanked him for that. And I thanked his kids when I told them that, that story. But that, uh, and I never looked back. And so I think it's important uh, that we all recognize that uh, we, we need to lead by example. You know, we need to show people the way, and so many people in this community have done that. Exactly, and the idea of Lador Vador, right, can be your kids, but it's also a generational thing, and, and I look to you as that, right? It's, I've got my dad and my grandpa, obviously, but there's people on this call who I've known my whole life who are mentors in so many ways, and and then we're sort of looking at what does next generation mean, right? And I saw Jonah's name on this call and I saw from Instagram that he's at least been with Jesse in the last day. So, so they're both on here and they're entrepreneurs. Today, I also spoke to Matt Gellis, who Nefco is, is a sponsor of this. And I also was on the phone with Matt Hoffman. And I guess I'm an entrepreneur in, in, in this as well. And so we're seeing this sort of thing in Hartford as it continues on. And I, I do wonder sort of how you think about Hartford as a place that breeds entrepreneurship and breeds community. I mean, this is a, a small Jewish community, but it is clearly mighty. We raise a ton of money for our size and we have a ton of charities and programs that we fund and continually year over year, multiple schools, multiple synagogues. What do you think it is about Hartford that sort of allows that to be bred? What do you think it is about the people in this community that are so tight knit and, and wanna be here and wanna give back and wanna grow businesses here, even as if it's not, even if it's not right, a booming metropolis? Well, Hartford's the best city in the country, as I always say to people, and people, I get a chuckle out of people with that, but I believe that. Uh, must be something in the water, but there's a tagline, small city, big dreams, small city, big dreams. And, uh, you know, I, I really think, you know, the Gallus family, uh, the Zach's family, the next generation, this is a family, these are families uh, um, that love, love our community, obviously, love their children, want to support their children. But um, I think there's, you know, a learned behavior. Uh, I, I, it's all about, you know, I, I'm so uh, lucky and fortunate. I don't know if Jesse and Joan are on the call right now, but to, to have the most amazing kids um, ever uh, that are, are following their dreams and uh, they're entrepreneurs, but, um, they're also giving back to the, their communities. And, you know, they're involved with ADL, they're involved with the Holocaust Museum, they're involved uh, in Jewish causes, and they're in, in, involved in other philanthropic causes because it's a learned behavior. And, you know, we've been able to lead by example, lead by example, and they've been able uh, to, uh, to, to, to take that on. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, as a parent, um, you know, your proud, proudest moment is seeing your kids succeed. You know, our proudest moment is, is to see, you know, a Matt Gallis, uh, a, a Ben Zachs, a Jesse and Jonah Laz uh, succeed and do better than we've done and, 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 uh, do more for the community and uh, and accomplish your dreams and your goals. And, you know, don't always listen to your father or mother, or just go do it. Right. <laughs> in, in thinking that, we have a couple of questions about going towards the future as well. And, right, because your business, your core business, I guess we could say with parking, we are we're looking into a realm of Uber, 
and potentially driverless cars. How do you think about staying innovative when the idea of a car and transportation could be changing? I, I sometimes joke that I've got a one-year-old now and there's a, there is an, a non-zero chance that he looks at me and says, I can't believe you drove your own car. You're an idiot. You couldn't have been safe. You were on your phone and now I just get driven everywhere. And I don't think that's a crazy sort of leap to be at in 15 years when he would in theory get his license if, if we let him. But yeah. um, what do you, how do you continue to adjust and pivot for not just what am I doing with my business, but an ever-changing world? Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked that question because it's, 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 I'm so excited about the future of parking. And, and, and I'm so excited about innovation and technology. You know, we formed something called LAS University. We have an innovation and technology department. And the future of parking is gonna be around tech-enabled real estate. So we're always, I'll tell you a, a story. We're talking to somebody, you talk, wanna talk about the future, that is developing uh, a helicopter, an electric helicopter that lands on a rooftop of a garage and flies 200 miles an hour with 150 mile range like a plane and will be, they have a contract with UPS for the future of delivery and we're gonna be converting our rooftop garages to FBOs and storage and warehouses for last mile delivery. So that's just one example of innovation and technology that we're excited about for the future. Where do you think all those autonomous cars are gonna be serviced? Where do you think they're gonna be parked? Where do you think maintenance is gonna occur? You know, so we're already talking to Uber and Uber Elevate and drone delivery and all the different things that, you know, can you can reutilize and repurpose. And so, you know, again, with optimism and innovation, the future's bright. That's amazing. That sounds even better than Lamont's 303030 30, 30. <laughs> in Hartford. But it, it's it's really incredible. And you know, again, as I sort of brought up before, it's this idea of another one of those, right? It's it's innovation keeps happening. And what innovation looked like, I'm sure coming out of the dorm, which it was innovative for you to valet cars out of the dorm and at Frank's, and then to go into Hilton. And there are countless other of those that you probably have done, have forgotten more than you've done, uh, probably feels like, right? There's so many pivots in a business and it's just that continuation. And I think that the fact that, right, at, after 40 years, you can still always be looking towards the next thing, that's where inspiration comes in. I mean, I, if there are other folks, whether you're at the end of your career or like me at the beginning, to see that inspiration constantly happening and that innovation happening is really incredible. Um, and so I'm getting the, hey, last question sort of message and I'm getting <laughs> the thing. And so I'm a huge podcast listener and one of my favorites is How I Built This, which is about founders uh, who, and their sort of stories. And at the end, Guy Raz, who's the host, always asks the same question, which is how much of your success is due to luck and how much is of it is due to your hard work, determination, and skill. And I am not going to just steal his question, but I'm going to actually personalize it for you. And so the first book of your dad's that I read, and I think probably is most famous, has an unbelievable title of Faith and Destiny. And I wonder how you think of those two things, faith and destiny, being interlaid into your career and your success. And do faith and destiny exist or is it all based on your hard work and brain and how do you balance those? Well, you know, cause you know me, Ben, and you know, I'm a big believer in faith and destiny. You know, I, I believe in fate. I believe things happen for a reason. So we do need some luck along the way, but luck is no excuse for hard work and you got to do both. And, uh, and you got to take advantage of opportunities, but I'm a firm believer that, you know, these opportunities come about in certain ways and 
uh, you know, you never know where it's going to come from. And, you know, you could have a moment of being very worried and the next day somebody can come into your life or an opportunity can come into your life and, and change your trajectory. And so, uh, you know, um, I just close with this part of the story. Uh, it was it was fate that my father was in a selection line uh, facing death and saved by a woman that pretended that he was her son. And later on in life, he found her in Hartford and married her daughter that was in that selection line. So my grandmother saved my father's life before they even knew each other. And, and it was fate that uh, a Jewish family from, from Hartford, the Kerchevsky family, sponsored my mother and the Rabinowitz family to come to Hartford, who were big Federation people who were looking for immigrants to help and found their relative, the Rabinowitzes, my mother, Ruth, and brought them to Hartford. So that's all fate. And, uh, you know, I, I believe things happen for a reason. And, and I believe uh, that we're all lucky and we have to uh, be thankful. Al, I just want to say thank you because you are a, an inspiration and a mentor to everyone on this call, but I'm not going to speak for, I won't exactly speak for everyone, but I will speak for myself. I just feel lucky to have you as a mentor and, and more importantly, a friend. I think this community is incredibly lucky to have you as well. And uh, it's, when I think of two words, I think of incredible optimism and incre incredible warmth. And seeing how you treat your employees and how you think about what is going to happen next and only think of the goods that can happen with it. And I'm sure there's a lot of worrying and there's a lot of thought and data that goes into making decisions, but you, you find out that information and you trust it and then you bring the people around you to trust it. And that's something that, you know, I am trying to keep and learn. I'm sure others on this call will as well. And lastly, we're just, we're lucky to have you in this community and lucky to have that true innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that's created something um, that Hartford can be proud of and a business that Hartford can call its own, which is Laz Parking and all that you bring to it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And with that, I, I'm not exactly sure who I'm supposed to segue to next because I took the, the thing off the board, but I, I'm, well, I'll just send it to whomever now. <laughs> Al, you are up independently. Go ahead. I'm up? No, I had the easy one. I could have just given it right back to you. Oh, okay. Um, well, just thank you so much. Uh, for allowing me this time. Uh, you're all my friends, heroes, mentors, and you know, we, we share a common bond in, in support and love uh, for our Jewish community and the Jewish Federation. And, uh, and, and Ben, I can't thank you enough for your tremendous leadership uh, representing us, the next generation, this community, everything you've done for Salman Schechter, everything you've done for the Federation. Uh, you, you really make us proud. I know you make mom and dad so proud and everybody else. And, and so, um, you know, I just want to say, uh, as I said earlier, uh, this is a time uh, of a difficult time that we're all facing. Uh, every institution is facing a hard time. Businesses are facing a hard time. This is a time where we need to lean in and help each other. This is a time where if we have the opportunity to give back and help somebody in need, we got to dig in and do more. And to the extent uh, that anybody on this call or anyone in our community uh, could, could give more to the Federation, Now's the time to do it because there's people out there and agencies out there that need the help uh, and it's a time to dig in. We have great examples of mentors and leaders, 
on this call and in this community. And I'm just so appreciative to live in this community uh, and, to, and to be able to help give back. And I just encourage everyone to do as much as they can. And uh, David, thank you again for your tremendous leadership, your warmth, your inspiration, and your, your strength. And I know we're, we'll get through anything with you in charge. So thank you. Well, I get the uh, privilege of closing this event. And uh, thank you both Ben and Alan. That was so inspiring. And um, I, for one, in the middle of what we're going through right now, really needed something like this tonight. There has been great loss here, losing RBG this week and uh, what's happening in our country and to see Federation step up. This is what it's about, you know, us being one community, seeing everybody and uh, participating. And thank you all for being there. Um, before I say goodbye, I do want to share a few other uh, quick announcements. On October 22nd, the Federation Solomon Society will host a conversation with Mark Schenkman, founder and president of Schenkman Capital Management. He's one of the nation's largest money management firms. Rabbi Daniel Cohen, the author of What Will They Say About You When You're Gone? Creating a Life of Legacy, will interview Mark about his career, his values, and his philanthropy. The Solomon program will, low, will, will be lowering the minimum gift. Jay, David, or I will be happy to give you any of the details. I'm sure it will be an inspiring, inspiring night, hopefully as inspiring as this evening has been. Um, and on November 18th, as Ben mentioned earlier, Men's Engagement will welcome Ben back for a discussion about the impact of cannabis legalization on patients and entrepreneurs. It's open to everyone. And candidly, having been involved with Ben in this business, this is um, something that you really should think about and listen, listen to because it has a big impact on our generation and future generations. So please tune into that. Um, and finally, if you'd like to discuss a campaign pledge or be one of our business partners, we'd be happy to talk with you. We'll be calling you, we'll be staying in touch with you, and thank you all. Um, Shana Tova to everybody. Have a healthy, happy new year. Shana Tova. Thank you, everyone. Shana Tova. Thank you, Alan.